John chapter 7, starting at verse 1. After this, Jesus went around in Galilee. He did not want to go about in Judea, because the Jewish leaders there were looking for a way to kill him. But when the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brothers said to him, Leave Galilee and go to Judea, so that your disciples there may see the works you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. Therefore Jesus told them, My time is not yet here. For you any time will do. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that its works are evil. You go to the festival. I am not going up to this festival because my time has not yet fully come. After he said this, he stayed in Galilee. However, after his brothers had left for the festival, he went also, not publicly but in secret. Now at the festival, the Jewish leaders were watching for Jesus and asking, where is he? Among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about him. Some said, he's a good man. Others replied, no, he deceives the people. But no one would say anything publicly about him for fear of the leaders. Not until halfway through the festival did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. The Jews there were amazed and asked, how did this man get such learning without having been taught? <clears throat> Jesus answered, My teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. Whoever speaks on their own does so to gain personal glory. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There is nothing false about him. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet not one of you keeps the law. Why are you trying to kill me? You are demon-possessed, the crowd answered. Who is trying to kill you? Jesus said to them, I did one miracle and you were all amazed. Yet... Because Moses gave you circumcision, though actually it did not come from Moses but from the patriarchs, you circumcise a boy on the Sabbath. Now if a boy can be circumcised on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you angry with me for healing a man's whole body on the Sabbath? Stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. At that point, some of the people of Jerusalem began to ask, Isn't this the man they're trying to kill? Here he is speaking publicly and they're not saying a word to him. Have the authorities really concluded that he is the Messiah? But we know where this man is from. When the Messiah comes, no one will know where he is from. Then Jesus, still teaching in the temple courts, cried out, Yes, you know me and you know where I am from. I am not here on my own authority, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him, but I know him because I am from him and he sent me. At this they tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. Still, many in the crowd believed him. They said, When the Messiah comes, will he perform more signs than this man? The Pharisees heard the crowd whispering such things about him. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees sent temple guards to arrest him. Jesus said, I am with you for only a short time. And then I am going to the one who sent me. You will look for me, but you will not find me. 
And where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we cannot find him? Will he go where our people live, scattered among the Greeks, and teach the Greeks? What did he mean when he said, You will look for me, but you will not find me? And where I am, you cannot come. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this, he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. On hearing his words, some of the people said, surely this man is the prophet. Others said, he's the Messiah. Still others asked, how can the Messiah come from Galilee? Does not scripture say that the Messiah will come from David's descendants and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and the Pharisees. He asked them, why didn't you bring him in? No one ever spoke the way this man does, the guards replied. You mean he has deceived you also, the Pharisees retorted. Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? No, but this mob that knows nothing of the law, there is a curse on them. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier, and who was one of their own number, asked, Does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he has been doing? They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Look into it, and you will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. Well, thank you for that reading, Susie. And let me add my welcome to Tim. If you don't know me, my name's Pete, one of the leaders here at Trinity, and it would be lovely to meet you afterwards, if I haven't met you before. Uh, for the moment, if you could please keep your Bibles open in front of you, that chapter, John 7, and let me pray for us. Father, as we come to your word, we acknowledge that we are spiritually dull by nature. And we need your help to grasp spiritual reality. And so we pray this morning by your spirit, you would open our eyes. That we might understand and believe that we might see wonderful things in your word and the glory of your son. Help us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let us suppose, sir, that after you have left this sorry veil, you actually found yourself in heaven, standing before the throne. And there, in all his glory, sat the Lord, God, before your very eyes, beyond a shadow of doubt, what would you say? That was a question posed to the philosopher Bertrand Russell in the mid-20th century. He was a well-known atheist, um, confident of his own beliefs, author of an essay called Why I'm Not a Christian, and his answer, what would he say to God? Well, not enough evidence, God, not enough evidence. And for many people today, there would be much sympathy with this perspective. The suggestion is that knowing God is a matter chiefly of reason. The assumption uh, that we are by nature open to reason, truth seekers, and the issue is evidence. And so, if only God were clearer and the evidence for him more compelling, well then many more people would believe. And that's the problem. Not enough evidence, God. But I wonder if you buy that. 
Do you believe that belief in God is solely a matter of the mind, reason, intellect, evidence? And do you think we are really truth seekers, now open to the truth and nothing but the truth? Or could it be more complex than that? A few years ago, the social psychologist Jonathan Haidt wrote a book called The Righteous Mind. And in it, he argues that despite popular assumption, most of the decisions we make, the beliefs we hold, the morals we have, are in fact really not to do with reason at all. Now, sure, reason is a factor, but he says, no, really, it's our passions, our desires, our emotions, our intuitions that win the day. Now, often we just do what we want and then afterwards give reasons to explain our actions. Uh, to illustrate this, he uses the image of a rider on an elephant. So the rider's on top, and although it looks like he's in control, well, the reality is that the power, the weight, the force are all coming from the elephant below. It's the elephant who's really calling the shots. And the question is, could it be the same with belief in God? Could belief in God be as much a matter of the heart, what we really want, as the mind, the evidence for our beliefs? Uh, one philosopher, Thomas Nagel, once wrote very honestly about why he was an atheist. He said, it isn't just that I don't believe in God, it's that I hope there is no God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. And so today, as we think about this, the key question for us is this. How open really are you to God? Uh, we continue this morning our series in John's Gospel, where John is giving us reasons to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, uh, that we might believe and have life. Now, we're in the second section of the book, chapters 5 to 12, and in these chapters there are two main themes. First, Jesus' growing explanation of who he is, and second, the crowd's growing opposition to him. And in chapter 7, we have something of a diagnosis of unbelief, a study of why it is that people reject Jesus. And yet, in the very midst of this, we have one of the most remarkable invitations to come to Jesus and have life. Now, the context of chapter 7 is that Jesus is staying up north in Galilee to keep away from Jerusalem down south. And the reason is because the Jewish leaders are looking for a way to kill him. And then John tells us that Jesus' brothers urge him to go up to Jerusalem because it's festival time. Now, three times a year, the Jews flocked to the capital for the national feasts. And in the early autumn, it was time for the Feast of Tabernacles, sometimes called the Feast of Booths or In Gathering. Now, I don't know if you're into wild camping, but if you are into wild camping, well, this would be the feast for you. You would love this because for a whole week, the people were told they had to do this to live in booths, makeshift shelters made of wood gathered from nearby trees. It was a campus paradise because as well as celebrating the harvest and looking forward to future spiritual blessing, this festival looked back to the, the days of the wilderness when the Jews camped in the desert for 40 years. And so Jesus' brothers say to him, leave Galilee, go to Judea, so your disciples may see the works you do. Now for his brothers, the festival is the time for Jesus to act. It's a no-brainer. Thousands of people are going to be there. It's the perfect moment for Jesus to make his mark. Jesus, if you're ever going to be big, you've got to go to Jerusalem. Now is the time. But did you notice verse 5? John tells us, they are saying this because even his own brothers did not believe in him. That is, they are thinking in worldly, human terms about success. For them, it's just all about numbers. They don't realize that Jesus is not interested in popularity, in the praise of people. He's not about social media likes, viral videos, virtue signaling, or appealing to the next generation. No, despite the crowds, this is not his time because, verse 7, Jesus knows the world hates me 
because I testify that its works are evil. Now, Jesus can't go to Jerusalem in public. It's too dangerous. And so he stays at home. But you'll have noticed, uh, despite this conversation, he does, in fact, go to the festival, but in secret. And that turns out to be a very wise decision because we learn that in, in Jerusalem, everyone is looking for him. He's the talk of the town. And halfway through the festival, Jesus goes up to the temple courts and he begins to teach. And what we have in this chapter is Jesus teaching and the crowds responding. And as this happens, John emphasizes two main themes. Here's the first. Jesus has been sent from God, but the world cannot accept him. So as Jesus is teaching in the temple courts, in the middle of the festival, the Jews who are listening are just amazed by this man. Now they say, verse 15, how did this man get such learning without having been taught? And that's a pretty understandable question. Jesus was a formerly untrained rabbi. He came from a despised rural backwater in ancient Israel. He never left his own country. He never wrote a book. He never went to school. And yet, 2,000 years later, his teaching remains the most influential, relevant, and penetrating teaching in human history. Now, whatever you think about that, whatever you think of his teaching, you have to come to terms with its abiding influence. How did he get such learning, is the question. And his answer is that his teaching is not his own. Verse 16, he says, it comes from the one who sent me. And there's a reason why his teaching penetrates the human heart, because it comes from the one who created the human heart. And Jesus explains, there is a way to discern whether his teaching comes from God or not. And did you notice the way? The way to know is obedience. Verse 17, anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. But there's a problem, and it's the first reason the world cannot accept Jesus. The problem is, his listeners, well, they're not willing to obey. See, although the Jews have the law, the problem is they don't keep the law. Jesus says not even one of them. And his evidence is that they're trying to kill him. And that, of course, is breaking God's commandments. And Jesus says, uh, fascinatingly, it is this very lack of obedience that makes them blind to the reality of his identity. They're not willing to obey. And I think that for us is a, is a very uh, fascinating insight because... There's a sense in which knowledge is intellectual. John is giving us reasons to believe. That's why he's writing. But at the same time, what we're seeing is that knowledge is also experiential. To know that Jesus is from God and his teaching is wise actually involves putting it into practice. Seeing whether it makes sense of life. Seeing whether God does in fact know about reality more than we ourselves do. A few weeks ago, when, when Charlotte was baptized, she explained that one of the things that caused her to seek God was the moment she put into practice one of his commandments, to forgive. And it was when she forgave that she experienced there was something powerful there, liberating, life-giving, and wondered, could there be more to this? You see, obedience led to knowledge. If you're a Christian here this morning, Every time you choose to obey, well, you are having the opportunity to learn more of who God is, more of his wisdom, more of his grace, more of his goodness. But the flip side is also true. Every time you choose to disobey, there's a sense in which you are moving further from God. And if you know deep down that you would never actually obey God, if you know you would never submit to him, you'd never trust him, well, it just might be that you never come to know God. That's the problem for the crowd. They're not willing to obey. The second problem is that they're not able to make a wise judgment. And when Jesus says they're trying to kill him, 
Now they say, verse 20, you're demon-possessed, deluded. And yet Jesus knows full well the last time he was in Jerusalem, chapter 5, that's exactly what the religious leaders were trying to do because he healed a man on the Sabbath. Uh, Now the Sabbath was the weekly day of rest for the Jews, uh, the day when no work was permitted. And it was supposed to be the happiest day of the week. Uh, You don't have to work. That's a wonderful commandment. Um, But the religious leaders had twisted this life-giving commandment and turned it into a burden. Can't do this, can't do that. You're being watched. And so they opposed Jesus for breaking on the Sabbath when he healed a paralyzed man. But Jesus says, look, you're absurd and you're inconsistent because you also work on the Sabbath. Now, what he means is that they are willing to circumcise a baby boy. In the law, on the eighth day of a baby boy's life, the law said he was to be circumcised. It was was a badge of belonging to the, the people of God. And although ordinarily circumcising a baby boy would be seen as work, well, not so if it fell on the Sabbath. And Jesus says, look, if you're willing to do that, to circumcise, which was seen as an act of healing, well, how much more is it okay for me to heal a whole man on the Sabbath? And he pleads with them, stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. And so the issue is one of judgment. Even when Jesus performs the most extraordinary, life-giving miracle, healing a paralytic, they only see it as a reason to condemn him. They are instinctively suspicious and hostile towards him. And I think that is very significant for us today because many people just by nature assume the worst about Jesus and Christian faith. I know of a couple of students who were recently preparing to tell their parents the fearful news. They'd gone to university and become Christians. Terrible news. And they're just afraid of the response from their parents because they know the assumption is that's bad. That God is seen to be out to spoil fun and restrict and smother and take and dampen and trap and hem in. The assumption of many people is that life without God is fun and freeing and life with God is restrictive and awkward. People are instinctively suspicious and hostile. But can you see the irony? What Jesus is offering is life. Eternal, abundant life. He makes people whole. He restores us. He heals, forgives, renews. And if you can't see that as a good thing, well, there is perhaps something perverse going on. Something perverse in the human heart that twists the goodness of God into something to be afraid of. And that is their problem. They're not able to make a wise judgment. Third problem is that they're not open to God. Uh, The next thing that happens is that some of the people in Jerusalem, verse 25, wonder why it is that Jesus is being allowed to teach publicly. Now, they even falsely suppose that the authorities have concluded he's the Messiah. And they question this, verse 27. But we know where this man is from. When the Messiah comes, no one will know where he's from. Now, there was this strand of teaching among certain Jewish rabbis that said that the Messiah would be unknown and right up until the moment that he appeared. And on that basis, they disbelieved Jesus. Uh, we know this man. Uh, he grew up in Nazareth. He now lives in Capernaum. He can't be the Messiah. But Jesus questions them, verse 28, yes, you know me and you know where I'm from, which likely has the, the sense of, do you really know me? And do you really know where I am from? Because this is the problem. They don't know Jesus. Now, they don't realize he's from above. They don't grasp that he is the eternal son of the word of God made flesh. He's not here from his own authority. He's been sent from the Father. And that's the problem, verse 28. You do not know him. Because if they knew him, God, him, they'd recognize Jesus. And so there's a sense in which you need to know Jesus to know God. 
He's the one who reveals him. But there's also a sense in which you need to know God to know Jesus. That is, you need to be open to his existence and reality and his greatness to make sense of who Jesus is. And that's the problem. They're not open to God. Uh, They recognize a divine claim here and they want to seize him, even as others begin to believe him. Now, what the uh, religious establishment do is that they, they get wind of this and they send in their heavies, the temple guards, to arrest him. But in the meantime, Jesus explains, verse 34, that it won't be long before he's going. He says, you will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. Now, if we, if we know much about Jesus, we know that what he's talking about here is he's going to heaven. After he dies, he's going to rise and ascend and be with the Father in glory. But they are completely confused. Now, they wonder whether he's going to the Jews scattered among the Roman Empire. They have no idea what he's talking about. It's as if he's speaking a different language. And what it reveals in them is a closedness to God, a dullness to spiritual reality, a hardness of heart, which is really the problem. They're not open to God. And you know, that is a huge danger for us today. And we live in a culture which has almost wholesale edited out God, the author of life, from the story of existence. Now we do this in popular culture, the media, education, politics, almost every aspect of society. Now we have told ourselves there is no God. And we've told ourselves that we are little gods in control of our lives. We've told ourselves that all there is is this life and nothing more. And we have so repeated this story that we're just here by chance that it sounds credible to everyone around us. But what's actually happened is that we have lost our sense of wonder. And we've stopped asking the question, why? We have, as Paul puts it in Romans 1, suppressed the knowledge of God. And even though every single day we see evidence of God's glory shining forth around us, we have been conditioned to snuff it out and explain it away. And so to our culture, we think it implausible and unnecessary to believe in God. And one philosopher put it like this. He said, we have lost our sense of the intimate otherness of things. We've allowed habit to displace awe, inevitability to banish delight. And so only very occasionally do do we find ourselves brought to a pause by the utter uncanniness of the reality we inhabit, the strangeness of everything familiar. How odd, how unfathomable that anything exists at all. How disconcerting that the world and one's consciousness of it are simply there. And I wonder if that could be us. Have we lost our sense of wonder? Are we closed to God? That's the first thing we see in John 7. Jesus has been sent from God, but the world cannot accept him. But then second, Jesus offers living water, but only the thirsty will drink. So John then takes us to the last and the greatest day of the festival. And this was a really significant moment in the week. Um, During the feast, there was this water ritual uh, where the priest would draw water in a large container from the pool of Siloam nearby and carry the water to the temple and then pour it on the altar. And this symbolic act uh, with water was remembering God's provision of water in the desert. But it was also anticipating the outpouring of the Holy Spirit of the day when God would send all of his spiritual blessings, the day of salvation. And the prophets in the Old Testament, they, they use this image of water uh, as a rich picture to describe God's coming salvation. Uh, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. God said, I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and blessing on your descendants. And so the the first part of the Bible, the Old Testament, had 
look forward to this age of great spiritual blessing. There was going to be cleansing from sin. Uh, there was going to be uh, new hearts. There was going to be inner renewal. And with all that background in mind, Jesus, on the last and greatest day of the feast, stands up. And he, and he says in a loud voice the most remarkable claim. He says, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Now can you see what Jesus is saying? He's saying every spiritual blessing that God has promised can be found in me. He's saying all life and cleansing and hope and renewal can be found in me. He's saying all that will truly satisfy your heart can be found in me. And you'll have these things in abundance. See, the Bible says what we need most is cleansing from our sins, our many sins. What we need most is life with God, the God who made us. What we need most is inner renewal, saved from the corruption of our hearts. And this is the thing that God has done. He sent his son, Jesus, to save us from our sins by dying on the cross. And he sent his spirit to bring us to Jesus and make us new. And here we have one of the great realities of the gospel, that though we by nature do not want the God who made us, he by nature seeks after us. That though we by nature think of God as stingy and life sapping, he by nature offers us abundant life. That is the promise of the gospel, forgiveness for all of our sins, life with God forever, and the presence and power of God at work in us. But did you notice the condition that Jesus makes? Because this isn't for everyone. This is only for a certain kind of person. He says this is for the thirsty. It's for those who thirst for God. It's for those who sense a personal need. It's for those who want more. You can imagine walking in the desert and seeing in the distance an oasis. Well, the reason that you would then go towards the water is because you're thirsty. And if you're thirsty, you would give all you have to go and find water. And the question is, are you thirsty to know God? Do you sense that something is lacking? And do you long to be filled? Now that is a question for those of us who don't believe. But if we are Christians, it doesn't really change. Are you still thirsty to know God? Uh, do you long to know more of him? Experience more of his grace? Become more like his son? Grasp more of his glory? Do you thirst for God more than anything else? Well, as Jesus makes this promise, the, the reaction of the crowds is really not very promising. Uh, at, some, at first, some wonder if he's the Messiah, but it's not long before they want to seize him again. But because no one does, the temple guards then return to the chief priests and the Pharisees. And John finishes this chapter with the attitude of the religious leaders as they hear back from the temple guards. Now, the guards reveal a certain softness. They say, we couldn't bring him because no one ever spoke the way this man does. But the religious leaders only double down. And although they use arguments, we can clearly see that underneath their arguments is this hostile irrationality. They're elitist. They say, well, none of the rulers of the Pharisees have believed, only the mob. You may have heard that one before. Only stupid people believe in God. The, the clever people don't. Or well, they're just racist. They say, when Nicodemus asks them, questions them, they say, well, are you from Galilee too? Now, because, of course, Galileans, they don't make any sense. And then it seems that they simply lie. Uh, they say, look into it, no prophet comes from Galilee. But surely they know the Old Testament, where there are prophets that come from Galilee, Jonah, Nahum. 
But I think we're supposed to think that whatever arguments they use, there is clearly a deeper issue at play. They do not thirst. That's the problem. And why is that? Well, I take it the answer is because of what Jesus said at the very beginning. Verse 7. The world hates me because I testify that its works are evil. And so as we draw to a close, we come back to this thought. The reason that people don't want God is that they actually want their sin more than him. And so they have no room for Jesus. It's like John said in chapter 3, light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. So I wonder, could that be you? Could it be that we don't really want God because we want to hold on to our sins? And it's as if John is saying, look, can't you see what Jesus is offering you? Why would you not want living water? Why would you think of God as a God to be avoided? Can't you see what it's actually like? Why would you not come to Jesus? In C.S. Lewis's book, The The Silver Chair, a young girl called Jill Pohl has entered into a strange wood in the land of Narnia. And she finds herself alone and thirsty. Then she comes across this river and it makes her feel thirstier than ever before. But she starts to walk towards the river, but then suddenly she stops because she sees on the other side a lion standing there. And she thinks to herself, if I run away, he'll be after me in a moment. If I go on, I'll I'll run straight into his mouth. If you're thirsty, you may drink. For a second, she, she stares here and there, wondering who had just spoken. Then the voice says again, if you're thirsty, come and drink. It was a deep, wild and strong voice. Are you not thirsty? Said the lion. I'm dying of thirst, says Jill. Then drink, says the lion. Would you mind going away while I do? Says Jill. The lion answered this only by a look and a very low growl. Will you promise not to do anything to me if I come? Said Jill. I make no promise, said the lion. I daren't come and drink, said Jill. Then you will die of thirst, said the lion. Oh dear, said Jill. I suppose I must go and look for another stream then. There is no other stream, said the lion. And it was the worst thing she ever had to do. But she went forward to the stream knelt down and began scooping up the water in her hand. It was the coldest, most refreshing water she had ever tasted, for it quenched your thirst at once. I wonder how open really are you to God? And could it be that the best decision of your life would be to walk, however tentatively, towards Jesus? because it might be that you find life, eternal life. Let me pray. Our Father, as we come to think about these things and reflect on them, we acknowledge that we find it very hard to understand ourselves. We are people with very mixed motives. But we pray that you would help us Show us what is really going on in our hearts and cause us to seek you that we might know you, the God who is there, the God who is abundantly good and the God who offers us abundant life. Might we come to know Jesus as ours and to find rest for our souls. Help us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.